Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm here today with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with the symposium. Um, as always, there's going to be a PDF link for the text in the description box, and we are using the Loeb Classical Library of the symposium for those who want to find a different version of this translation. It's the Walter Lamb translation. So today we're going on to the speech of Pausanias. And uh, for those using this text, it's page 107. It's um, 180C is where we're starting from. Now, this speech, it's quite long. And here we're really seeing that interplay, that playing that Plato likes to do between appearance and reality. So I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with this one. This is my idea of fun is I checked the Internet to see if I could find a... Um, what do you call a common or mainstream interpretation of this speech? And I think I found the perfect one. Here is one from a site called Spark Notes, which I think is like my generation had cliff notes, where like if you uh, have to write a, a book report for school and you don't want to read the book, you would read these notes instead. And the idea is that you get the basic gist and then you can maybe get like a B on your research paper. There's not every detail there, but it's good enough to get the basics. So I checked. So it's SparkNotes seems like the same kind of thing. And so I, was, I read this and I pulled out just a little bit um, just to kind of give us a sense of what he's doing here. Oh, and I meant to take that paragraph out. Sorry. Um, okay, so from the summary, I actually just want to focus on the first paragraph. I meant to take the other one out. Um, I didn't want to give too much of the summary because we're actually going to read the text. But he, it says here that Pausanias points out that there are two kinds of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. First, there is heavenly Aphrodite, the daughter of Uranus, with whom he associates heavenly love. And secondly... There is common Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus and Dion, who is considered younger than heavenly Aphrodite and with whom he associates common love. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here is that many people do call Aphrodite the goddess of love, and so it's not wrong. But technically, Aphrodite is beauty. And so, and in this dialogue, this is significant because Plato is playing with this relationship between beauty and love. And we need to keep that in mind. And it's going to finally come to a culmination with Socrates' speech. And so we do want to see how he uses them here. And we want to ask ourselves, is Pausanias using these two kinds of Aphrodite, heavenly Aphrodite and common Aphrodite, as common love and heavenly love, or is he using it as beauty and saying that there is an accompanying love that goes with each one, a respective type of love that goes with each one? So we want to take a look at that. But I want to jump to the commentary. I pulled out just um, two paragraphs here to give us a basic sense of the gist. It, was, it went on for like a page and a half or so, but this will just give us a sense of where this summary is coming from. So the idea is that this should just give you the basics. This is what it's about. So you can write your research paper or your book report or whatever and get your decent grade and move on. So it's supposed to cut through all the politicalization or whatever, all the distinctions and just say, this is what it's about. So let's take a look at what SparkNote says Pausanias' speech is about. It says that Pausanias sharply criticizes those who take advantage of young foolish boys or of women for the sake of sexual gratification. He suggests that this is inappropriate behavior and it brings a bad name to love and sexual pleasure altogether. He goes so far as to recommend that laws be made to prohibit such behavior. Pausanias' central argument then is that love is only beneficial when it is directed toward the end of virtue. Lovers should seek to improve their loved ones and loved ones should look to gain wisdom from their lovers. We should note, however, the asymmetrical nature of this relationship where loved ones are also expected to sexually gratify their lovers in return for the virtue they are taught. 
Pausanias's point is that such sexual gratification is laudable, but only on the condition that it is pursued with the end of virtue in mind. So according to this summary here in this commentary, this speech then is moving us away from the purely physical into the idea of virtue being what should guide these relationships. So what we want to do as we're reading is see if this fits our reading of it. Do we think that this writer writing this sort of paper would get a B or would we give it a different grade? Okay, so that's what we want to keep in mind as we go to the text. And now if you'll give me just a moment, I'm going to switch to the text. Okay, here we are. We're looking now at the speech of Pausanias. And uh, this time I think I'm going to be doing a lot of the reading, partly because I do want both of you to be focused on thinking about the meaning of it. And I know it can be hard to think about the meaning when you're thinking about reading it and you're you know, just focusing on the reading. It can be hard to read off the screen. Um, but also I'm going to be stopping frequently because we have to be very careful here and make sure that we really understand what he's saying. So now, as I've been doing, I'm going to switch to the text so that I can scroll through it, which means that I won't see your faces. So please um, jump in whenever you want to comment, okay? I won't see you if you just make a motion. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm looking at the text. And I'm actually going to be using my text some of the ways here because it can be hard for me sometimes to f read off a screen. Um, but okay, so here's the speech. He says that such in the main was Phaedrus' speech, so finishing up that, as reported to me. It was followed by several others, which my friend could not recollect at all clearly. So he passed them over and related that of Pausanias, which ran as follows. So here is Pausanias' speech. He says, I do not consider Phaedrus our plan of speaking a good one. If the rule is simply that we are to make eulogies of love. If love were only one, it would be right. But, you see, he is not one. And this being the case, it would be more correct to have it previously announced what sort we ought to praise. So notice he's changing the rules. Now this defect I will endeavor to amend, and will first decide on a love who deserves our praise, and then will praise him in terms worthy of his Godhead. Notice here also that love is masculine. He's using masculine pronouns. We are all aware that there is no Aphrodite or love passion without a love. True, if that goddess were one, then love would be one. But since there are two of her, there must needs be two loves also. Does anyone doubt that she is double? Surely there is the elder of no mother born but daughter of heaven, whence we name her heavenly, while the younger was the child of Zeus and Dion, and her we call popular. So in that previous um, commentary, the word was common, just a different translation, but here we're using popular. It follows then that of the two loves also, the one ought to be called popular as fellow worker with the one of those goddesses and the other heavenly. So let me pause here for a moment, then. What is the relationship between love and Aphrodite? Maybe it's that, you know, beauty draws us to love. Mm -hmm. Like a predecessor kind of relationship. I don't know. So <laughs> you see them, though, as separate. You do see that they're separate? I think so, yeah. And he says, you cannot have Aphrodite. So he calls her love passion. And you can't have that love passion without a love. So which is higher? Which comes first? I would think the passion, right, would come first and then, then the love. But the older and younger mentioned here. Hmm. I might be wrong now. <laughs> what do you think, Jed? Uh, I'm not hearing you. 
you can't have the passion without the love. Mm -hmm. So the love would precede the passion. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay, so we have a vote for love first and a vote for beauty first. Uh, those of you watching, let me know in the comments which you think is first, but we want to see how he's going to play with these. So, yeah, so, so the love passion certainly chases the love, right? Okay, now let's um, let's go on now and see what more he's going to say about these two types of love. It follows then that of the two loves also, the one ought to be called popular is fellow, oh, I'm sorry, oh, the fellow worker with the one of those goddesses and the other heavenly. Sorry, I read that again. All gods, of course, ought to be praised. But nonetheless, I must try to describe the faculties of each of these two. For of every action it may be observed that as acted by itself, it is neither noble nor base. And I'm going to highlight this for a moment here. Um, this is the principle that's going to be guiding the whole speech. For every action it may be observed that as acted by itself, it is neither noble nor base. For instance, in our conduct at this moment, whether we drink or sing or converse, none of these things is noble in itself. Each only turns out to be such in the doing, as the manner of doing it may be. For when the doing of it is noble and right, the thing itself becomes noble. When wrong, it becomes base. And so that's his principle. And he says, so also it is with loving, and love is not in every case noble or worthy of celebration, but only when he impels us to love in a noble manner. So we have two things to look out here for here. First of all, we have to ask ourselves if this basic principle is correct, and then we also have to see how he defines noble action versus base action. So first this question, um, that the action itself is neither noble nor base, the nobility is in the doing. Do either of you have any opinions at this point on that idea? Yeah, I agree because of, you know, the action in itself is maybe, you know, you don't have the context. You need the, you know, the context around that action to understand if it's, you know, good or bad. Mm. How about the nobility in a person? Is it in the action or in the state of mind that does the action? I'd say this, the state of mind that was in, in the action. If you had good intentions, it's more noble of you, but, you know, sometimes it might not always work out, so... So which would you rate more as more important? If if somebody does the right thing for the wrong reasons, is that more noble than someone who does the wrong thing for the right reasons? Do you want to yeah, I, would, I would say the yeah, yeah, I would say the wrong, doing the wrong thing for the right reasons is more you know, more noble um, because you have intentionality. But yeah, it goes along with what we just said too. So then the nobility is in the intentions more than in the doing. Sure. Is that right? Mm. Okay. Whereas he's saying that it's in the doing. And so he's focusing only on the actions and not on the intentions. And that's going to become important as we go. And that's why I was pressing that point. But yeah, it certainly sounds good on the surface until we think about it and realize, oh, there's a, a weakness here. Um, but that's his argument, that it's in the doing. And so we have to see how he's going to describe that then. What is his idea of noble action and base action? Okay, now the love that belongs to the popular Aphrodite is in very truth popular. 
and does his work at haphazard. This is the love we see in the meaner sort of men, who in the first place love women as well as boys, oh my God. And secondly, where they love, they are set on the body more than the soul. And thirdly, they choose the most witless people they can find, since they look merely to the accomplishment and care not if the manner be noble or no. So it certainly sounds like we're going in the way of virtue here, right? It sounds like a good position to be taking, right? That he's against um, going solely for bodily pleasure and finding people who are witless, as he says. And do we agree that we're with him so far? Yeah. Mm. Hence, they find themselves doing everything at haphazard, good or its opposite, without distinction. For this love proceeds from the goddess who is far the younger of the two, and who in her origin partakes of both female and male. So remember the popular um, Aphrodite is the daughter of Zeus and Dion. But the other love springs from the heavenly goddess, who firstly partakes not of the female, but only of the male. So this one springs from heaven or Uranus and has no mother. And that's why he accredits um, um, homosexual love to, um, to heavenly um, Aphrodite. Um, secondly, the elder is untinged with wantonness, where for those who are inspired by this love partake them to the male, for fondness for what has the robuster nature and a larger share of mind. So it sounds like he values intellect. So now we're going to get a sense then of how he sees that playing out. He says, even in the passion for boys, you may note the way of those who are under the single incitement of this love. And here we're looking at heavenly love, right? They love boys only when they begin to acquire some mind. Okay, so we're looking for, again, he seems to value intellect. So now how does he define that? A growth associated with that of down on their chins. Where's my mouse? I'm trying to, my cursor's not on the screen for some reason. Oh, there it is. Okay, down on their chins. Do either of you know what that means? Maybe when they start growing a beard, they have some hair on their face. Uh, it's actually before that. It's that very thin hair of like adolescence, actually like early adolescence, maybe like 10, 12 years old before the hair grows in. So down is that very thin hair that's before um, puberty, before growing a beard. Women have, although, of course, we don't like to talk about it, but we have, you know, little hairs. Those very um, smooth um, hairs with no color, that's down. So he's looking for the growth of down on their chin. So he's looking at young, early adolescence. We would call this like, you know, 10, maybe 13 at the most. That's the age he's looking at starting to seem a little questionable, his virtue, right? But okay, it's a different culture, a different time. We'll read on. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He says, I conceive that those who begin to love them at this age are prepared to be always with them and share all with them as long as life shall last. They will not take advantage of a boy's green thoughtlessness to deceive him and make a mock of him by running straight off to another. So he wants a love that's going to last, right? Against this love of boys, a law should have been enacted. Okay, now this is sounding a little bit more like something that we can get on board with, right? Do you both agree that a law should be enacted against the love of boys who are only 12, 10, 12 years old? Surely. Surely. And what should the law do? Jed, what's he, without reading on here, before we read on... If there were such a law, what would be the point of it in our modern times? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to prevent um, manipulation and taking advantage of 
uh, Young Boys? Mm-hmm. Oh, do you mean the name of it? No, 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 no. But yeah, your, your first answer was right. The point of the law is to protect the young boys against being manipulated. But let's see what he thinks this law should be. And I'm reading from here against. Against this love of boys, a law should have been enacted to prevent the sad waste of attentions paid to an object so uncertain. For who can tell where a boy will end at last, vicious or virtuous in body and soul? What's the purpose of his law? To protect the lover from um, falling upon a witless Mm -mm. love. Yes, because, you know, these young adolescents, they may, you know, change their mind. He wants somebody who will stay for life. You should be able to know by 12 years old who you want to spend the rest of your life with. Some witless boy may, you know, have an opinion of his own and leave. So there needs to be a law against that. He goes on to say that good men, however, voluntarily make this law for themselves. And it is a rule which those popular lovers ought to be forced to obey, just as we force them so far as we can to refrain from loving our freeborn women, known as freeborn. But going back to the first idea, he's saying that if a 12-year-old does indeed go along with this, then that's virtuous. But a boy who changes his mind, that's the popular lover, and he should be forced to stay in that relationship. Do you agree with that? Do you, I mean, do you agree that that interpretation is correct or do you see something different here? Is that what it says? I think so. Mm. Do we, yes, but I disagree with the sentiment strongly. Yes, of course. <laughs> do we still see this as a um, image of virtue? How are we feeling about the spark? No. No. Yeah. No, no, I think the spark notes may, might have uh, missed the point a little bit. We're, we're starting yeah. to have some doubts about those spark notes. Yes. Okay, there are the that, uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jed. I was going to say that B on the test um, is, is, is starting to uh, seem less than virtuous for us. We may have to change that grade, yes. Well, there are the persons responsible for the scandal, which prompts some to say it is a shame to gratify one's lover. Now, whenever we use this language, some people say this. What's it usually followed by? What is the implication? Does he agree or does he take the opposite view? No, they usually take the opposite. Right. And in, in fact, that seems to be a, a theme in the Platonic texts. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, most notable, uh, I'm r- reminded very strongly of that part in the Republic where Socrates says, some people call this uh, the good mm. when he's referring to the idea of the good. Mm-hmm. I don't want to stray from the text, but that's a big one for me. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. So here he's saying that some people think it's a shame to gratify one's lover. The implication then is that he thinks that it is good to gratify one's lover. And notice here throughout that he is calling um, himself the lover and the person he's chasing is the beloved. Um, So he wants... So his idea of this virtuous sort of love includes the young boy gratifying the lover. He says such are the cases that they have in view. Like so those people who think this is bad, they have this ugly popular view in mind. Um, they observe all their recklessness and wrongful doings. And surely whatsoever is done in an orderly and lawful manner can never bring reproach. Let me highlight that too. So there's another principle that he's holding. Sorry, I think we went too far. It's hard to highlight, send this. Um, Whatever is done in an orderly and lawful manner can never justly bring reproach. So as long as the laws are in your favor, you can behave in this way towards 
young adolescents. And he says, further, it is easy to note the rule with regard to love in other cities. There it is laid down in simple terms, while ours here are complicated. For in Ellis and Boeotia, and where there is no skill in speech, they have simply an ordinance that it is seemly to gratify lovers. And no one, whether young or old, will call it shameful, in order, I suppose, to save themselves the trouble of trying what speech can do to persuade the youths, for they have no ability for speaking. So no point trying to talk those kids into it. They're too young. But in Ionia, in many other regions where they live under foreign sway, it is counted a disgrace. So notice the language here that by bringing in the idea of foreigners, it's already kind of signaling that this is something foreign to us, something different, something we disagree with. Foreigners hold this thing and all training in philosophy and, and sports to be disgraceful because of their despotic government. Since, I presume, it is not in the interest of their princes to have lofty notions engendered in their subjects or any strong friendships and communions, all of which love is preeminently apt to create. So he's saying that love is creating all of these good things like strong friendships and communions and lofty notions. And so we have to see if he's going to support this. It is a lesson that our despots learned by experience from Aristogates' love and Harmodius' friendship grew to be so steadfast that it wrecked their power. Thus, where it was held a disgrace to gratify one's lover, the tradition is due to the evil ways of those who made such a law, that is, to the encroachments of the rulers and to the cowardice of the ruled. But where it was accepted as honorable without any reserve, this was due to a sluggishness of mind in the lawmakers. In our city, we have far better regulations, which, as I said, are not so easily grasped. Okay, so now he's going to give us some regulations. So he's saying having completely outlawing this kind of child love is no good, but simply um, having no rules at all is sluggishness of mind. You need to have some certain regulations to make it virtuous. What are you thinking so far as we go through this? Do either of you have any opinions about what we're reading here? I would say his point about the law, just because you're following the law doesn't mean necessarily what you're doing is virtuous. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the laws are supposed to just, you know, guide us, but uh, they might not have everything, you know, covered. So I thought that point was uh, like a little put in the, the cart before the horse. Mm. Yeah, it's very questionable, right, to say, well, there's no law against it. So that makes it right. And it was done in an orderly way. Taking on a 12-year-old lover was done in an orderly way, so that makes it okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's very questionable reasoning. So you'll see this throughout this whole speech where he'll say some general things that maybe on the surface, if you're not thinking it through, it sounds reasonable. Okay, yeah, you want to be orderly and follow the law. And he's using a lot of the right keywords, like talking about being mindful and valuing virtue and traditions and so on. It sounds good on the surface. And then you have to look, though, at his examples and you'll see a real contrast. I imagine Plato had a lot of fun writing this. But I do wonder about the actual historical Pausanias. Was he really this bad? It's really sad if he was. Um, okay, well, it's, although, it's, it's as though... Mm -hmm. His argument looks attractive on the surface, right. but it lacks mind mm -hmm. within it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, His speech, speech seems to be a witless love itself. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Yes, and it seems very much like the popular love as he's describing it. 
It gets even worse. Let's go on. He says, consider, for instance, our saying that it is more honorable to love openly than in secret, especially when the beloved, and that's again the young boy, excels not so much in beauty as in nobility and virtue. So what kind of young boy is he looking for? Is it noble and virtuous? Yeah, but being well, we're, he we have a, he we already see he has a very questionable notion of virtue, and it's really just if you do what he wants, it's virtuous, right? <laughs> it's very questionable. And as for nobility, what does that mean? What images does that bring to mind? Just a high status, mm. or maybe wealth, exactly being a free person. Exactly. He's looking for a rich boy. And again, what a wonderful encouragement a lover gets from us all. We have no thought of his doing anything unseemly, and success in his pursuit is counted honorable and failure disgraceful. And how in his endeavors for a success, our law leaves him a free hand for performing such admirable acts as may win him praise while the same acts, if attempted for any other purpose or effect to which one might be inclined, would bring one nothing in return but the sharpest reproach. So we already see here he has an idea that there are some things that you can do that would be um, shameful in any other circumstance. So it doesn't sound like something that would be virtuous. But we're going to see what his examples are. For suppose that with the view of gaining money from another or some office or any sort of influence, a man should allow himself to behave as lovers commonly do to their favorites. Okay, we'll just highlight the two lines there. So now we're going to see how he thinks lovers commonly behave towards their favorites. And favorites there is another word for the beloved, so the young boy. Pressing their suit with supplications and entreaties, binding themselves with vows, sleeping on doorsteps and submitting to such slavery as no slave would ever endure. Both the friends and the enemies of such a man would hinder his behaving in such fashion. For while the latter would reproach him with adulations and ill breeding, the former would admonish him and feel ashamed of his conduct. But in a lover, all such doings win only win him favor. By free grant of our law, he may behave thus without reproach, as compassing a most honorable end. Let me stop there for a moment. Jed, what are your thoughts so far? I'm reminded of that uh, scene from the movie where the guy is standing in, in front of the house with the boom box holding it up, um, acting in a way that would appear shameful. I mean, he's, he's uh, pretty close to being on the doorstep, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of valued as a, a romantic gesture, whereas, and kind of even more romantic because it would otherwise be seen as kind of ridiculous to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you're describing sounds comical or ridiculous. I would suggest this goes even further because remember, he's courting a child. And he's sleeping on the doorsteps and making all kinds of promises. It sounds like he's stalking this kid. But, um, you know, we have some image. I mean, I don't want to add anything to it. So, um Right, so it would be holding up that boombox, but it would be playing um, uh, the Wiggles. <laughs> and he says, strangest of all, he alone in the vulgar opinion has indulgence from the gods when he forsakes the vow he has sworn. For the vow of love passion, they say, is no vow. Remember up here, he said he's making all kinds of vows. They don't mean anything. What are you thinking of this so far, Jacob? 
Are these virtuous oh. acts? Sorry, are these noble acts? Because remember, that was his basic principle. If the action is noble, then it's the noble love. Is he talking about noble action from the lover? I think not. Uh, even if it's legal, it's not. It's not virtuous. And yeah, holding your vows, you know, is is virtuous or, you know, keeping keeping your word mm -hmm. is, you know, something that would be virtuous. Right. But if you're under the sway of love passion, he's saying, you don't have to keep your word. So it reminds me of those uh, pickup artists, <laughs> those <laughs> people that we consider sleazy in our culture, those pickup artists who, who uh, try and say whatever they can to... Uh, to bed the girl. So true it is that both gods and men have given absolute license to the lover, as our Athenian law provides. Thus far, then, we have ground for supposing that here in our city, both loving someone and showing affection to one's lover are held in highest honor. But it happens that fathers put tutors in charge of their boys when they are beloved to prevent them from conversing with their lovers. The tutor has strict injunctions on the matter, and when they observe a boy to be guilty of such a thing, his playmates and fellows reproach him, while his reproachers are not in their turn withheld or upbraided by their elders for speaking amiss. What does that mean? What did he just say? That's some... Um... You know, the peers of the boy or, or, you know, his teachers might, you know, uh, get, you know, tell him not to do this, you know, not to, you know, fall in with the wrong crowd here. But that the, you know, the kind of the groomer there is not uh, held to that standard from from their elders, you know, that they, you know he should be in trouble. Maybe there should be a law or something against it to make sure that he is reproached as well. Who are his reproachers? Read it again. It says in here, the elders, why they are elders. So maybe, you know, in the case of the speaker here, it would be, you know, the friends of the speaker. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I think it's hard to see this because the juxtaposition between what we expect to see and what he's actually saying is just so different. Um, fathers put tutors in charge of their boys when they're beloved to prevent them from conversing with their lovers. What does that imply? Because remember, before we were wondering if maybe it is a different culture and a different time, maybe having a 12-year-old lover is not strange for them. But what is this saying? Is this accepted a, in Athenian society? Doesn't seem so. A strict injunction on the matter. Mm. So it seems like the tutor's there to protect protect the boys. Exactly. So Pausanias is complaining that fathers protect their early adolescent sons from men like him. And also we see that the playmates reproach them. So it's not something normal. If, uh, if one of the kids on the playground has an older lover, it's not a normal thing. The other kids are going to tease him. But he's complaining that the kids who tease him or reproach him are not in their turn um, punished or upgraded by their elders. So he's complaining. Oh. This behavior is like his behavior is not accepted. And it's teased or reproached. He's complaining about it. And he says, from this, it might rather be inferred that his behavior is held to be a great disgrace in Athens. Can you imagine that? Some people may make that mistake. But in truth of it, I think the truth of it, I think, is this. The affair is no simple thing. You remember we said that by itself it was neither noble nor base, but that it was noble if nobly conducted and base if basely conducted. To do the thing basely, and so here's his definition. So he repeated his basic premise, the basic 
rule that his whole speech, the principle, his whole speech follows. And now he's going to give us some examples. Um, to do the thing basely is to gratify a wicked man in a wicked manner. But nobly means having to do with a good man in a noble manner. Let me highlight this. This is very vague language. I don't think I understand what he said here, Jed. What does this say mean? What is noble? What's the noble way of of acting in this situation? Well, it sounds like what he said is noble is one that goes along with his way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, a boy who's agreeable. Mm -hmm. And if the laws make lawmakers uh, make laws against it, they're um, mushy minded. Um, so what would be noble is to go along with him and mm. so, uh, he's not, he's not talking about a principle here. He's not talking about the action itself. He's talking about who it's with. So long as it's with him, <laughs> going along with him, yes, it seems to be a good thing for him. Uh, yeah. Having to do with is a very um, nice way of saying gratify the lover and do it. And he should be a good man in his definition of good man, because, of course, that's subjective. And in a noble manner means the way that he wants you to do it. Yes. And by wicked, we mean that popular lover who craves the body rather than the soul. As he is not in love with what abides... He himself is not abiding. As soon as the bloom of the body, I'm sorry, where I lost my spot. Um, as soon as the bloom of the body he so loved begins to fade, he flutters off and is gone, leaving all his speeches and promises dishonored. Whereas the lover of a nature that is worthy abides throughout life as being fused into one with the abiding. So again, when he's speaking in general, it does sometimes sound something positive, but you have to see if his examples actually support that. Now, remember, he said that he doesn't have to keep his promises, but the young boy has to keep his promises. If the young boy goes back on his own promises, that's the popular love. But the older man, he can go back on his vows and his promises, and that's okay. Now, our law has a sure and excellent, excellent test. Oh, good. We have a test because it's really hard to find, you know, if you have the popular love or the heavenly love. So we want to see the test. Our law has a sure and excellent test for the trial of these persons showing which are to be favored and which to be shunned. In the one case, accordingly, it, encourage, it encourages excuse me, pursuit but flight in the other, applying ordeals and tests in each case, whereby we are able to rank the lover and the beloved on this side or on that. And so it is for this reason that our convention regards a quick capitulation as a disgrace, for there ought first to be a certain interval and generally approved touchstone of time. So that's the first test, that you shouldn't capitulate quickly. Don't submit quickly. And second, it is disgraceful if the surrender is due to gold or public preferment or is a mere cowering away from the endurance of ill treatment or shows the youth not properly contemptuous of such benefits as he may receive in pelf or political success. So what is the second rule or the second test? What would be disgraceful for the young boy to do? No, one of them is accepting money and the other maybe is uh, not understanding the benefits of the advance mm -hmm. right. from political or right. yeah, various. Now, remember earlier he said he's looking for a rich boy, but he doesn't want the young boys to be with him for money or for um, political success or that sort of thing. So, again, there's a double standard, isn't there? For in the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I agree. 
For in these there appears nothing steadfast or abiding, unless it be the impossibility of their producing a noble friendship. One way remains in our custom whereby a favorite may rightly gratify his lover. Oh, good. So now we're going to find out how this young boy can rightly gratify his lover. It is our rule that just as in the case of the lovers, it was counted no flattery or scandal for them to be willingly and utterly enslaved to their favorites. So there is left one sort of voluntary thraldom, which is not scandalous. I mean, in the cause of virtue. They can be willingly and utterly enslaved to their favorites. <laughs> okay, let's see how he, he thinks this should go. He says, it is our subtle tradition that when a man freely devotes his service to another in the belief that his friend will make him better in point of wisdom, it may be, or in any of the other parts of virtue, this willing bondage is also no sort of baseness or flattery. This willing bondage. Grammar question, what is that referring to? Jed, do you see? Uh, grammar as in the oxymoron nature of it? No, no, just um, willing bondage is a reference back to something in the first part of the sentence. So he's suggesting that the child has to become his slave under the pretense that he will be made wiser. Yes, exactly. Which mm -hmm. jumps out at me as the sort of justification I've heard behind two things, slavery we get to enslave this people because we are by nature better and wiser. They are uncultured savages. And just by our presence will they be made better. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because earlier in the text, um, Agathon said something like, just by your presence, Socrates, I will be filled with wisdom and made better. Yes. Um, and another case that I've heard it is in the case of religion. I mm. mean, um, he's going to go on now to talk about the rules here. So let us compare the two rules, one dealing with the passion for boys, which is the, the common love, and the other with the love of wisdom in all virtuous ways. And so we see which one he wants us to agree with. By this, we shall see if we are to conclude, here's the big conclusion, it's a good thing that a favorite should gratify his lover. That's what it all comes down to. So these lofty words like love of wisdom in all virtuous ways, what he really wants to conclude, it all comes down to, again, that idea that the favorite should gratify his lover. For when lover and favorite come together, each guided by his own rule, and remember they have uh, different rules, on the one side of being justified in doing any service to the favorite who has obliged him, and then the other of being justified in showing any attentions to the friend who makes him wise and good. The elder of his plenty contributing to intellectual and all other excellence. The younger in his paucity acquiring education in all learned arts. Only then at the meeting of these two principles in one place... Only then and there, and in no other case, can it befall that a favorite may honorably indulge his lover. So that's the case. Only then, at the meeting of these two. Okay, so we want to keep this in mind. It's, we're going to come back to this. So he says again, the elder has to contribute intellectually and other excellences to give that to the young boy. And the boy, in his return, in return, satisfies the lover. That's the deal, right? That's the honorable kind of love. Do we all agree? Did anyone see anything different? I agree with the interpretation of the text, but yeah. <laughs> now they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> to have such hopes deceived is no disgrace. 
while those of any other sort must be disgraceful whether deceived or not. For dispose that a youth had a lover he deemed to be wealthy, and after uh, obliging him for the sake of his wealth were to find himself deceived and no money to be got, since the lover proved to be poor. This would be disgraceful all the same, since the youth may be said to have revealed his character and shown himself ready to do anyone any service for pelf, and this is not honorable. By the same token, when a youth... I'm going to move this down. Um, by the same token, when a youth gratifies a friend, supposing him to be a good man, and expecting to be made better himself as a result of his lover's affection, and then finds he is deceived since his friend proves to be vile and destitute of virtue. Even so, the deception is honorable. For this youth is also held to have discovered his nature by showing that he would make anyone the object of his utmost ardor for the sake of virtuous improvement. And this, by contrast, is supremely honorable. Thus, by all means, it is right to bestow this favor for the sake of virtue. What is this argument here? This is the sort of thing you hear in those two examples I gave earlier. When found out or when, yeah, when caught out, these sorts of people blame the victim, mm -hmm. blame the person, yeah, the, the person who has been deceived. Right. When he talks about noble actions, noble doings versus base actions, does that apply to both the young boy and the older man or to only one of them? Only to the older man. I'm sorry. Uh, the older man uh, doesn't have to be virtuous himself. Um, I don't know whether that agree that conforms with his earlier principle um, because he, he did say it was the action mm -hmm. that made something right or not. Mm -hmm. So here is the action is uh, deceit. Right. His intention is the same. His intention is to uh, have this uh, child as a lover. Mm -hmm. So he seems to be contradicting what he said earlier. Um, and your question is, does the, sa does the same standard hold for the beloved, for the child? No. Um, for some reason, the child who's been tricked uh, is the one lacking, is showing his bad nature for having been tricked. And if I'm seeing it right. No, no, no. What he says here, let's go back, because he gave first the example of money. And he says that if you're with a lover for money and then you get tricked, it's still, it, that's on the boy because he shouldn't have been um, seducing somebody for money. So again, he's letting the older man off the hook in both cases. But because the boy was after money, that makes it bad. Whether he's tricked or not, we don't have any sympathy for the kid who got tricked because he was doing it for the wrong reasons. That's what he's saying there. And then in the later example, he's saying that if the boy gratifies a friend, supposing him to be a good man and expecting to be made better himself as a result of the lover's affection, and then he finds that he's deceived, well, since his friend proves to be vile and destitute of virtue, so he's deceived, even so the deception is honorable. So again, there's no judgment about the older man. But if the child got tricked with the best of intentions of wanting to be made better, of believing this man was wise, then this is still heavenly love and following heavenly Aphrodite. That seems to be what it's saying. Oh, right. And the following line for this youth is also held to have discovered his nature. Mm -hmm. This his refers to the man, the old man. No, himself. Himself. The youth is also being held to, to have discovered his own nature. By showing that he like, make anyone the object of his utmost ardor for the sake of virtuous improvement. Oh, so it's good. So it's okay for him to have been tricked. Because it shows that he is a virtuous boy for going, exactly. Uh, exactly. going for men of. Yes. For, uh, so that was still heavenly love.
And then in the <laughs> and then in the very next line, this, referring to what he just described, is the love that belongs to the heavenly goddess, heavenly itself and precious to both public and private life. For this compels lover and beloved alike to feel a zealous concern for their own virtue. But lovers of the other sort belong to all the belong all, sorry, to the other goddess, the popular. Such, Phaedrus, is the contribution I'm able to offer you on the spur of the moment, so this is just off the top of his head, toward the discussion of love. And that's his conclusion. So what do we think? Jacob, what are your thoughts? Samias needs to go to jail. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think he has a, a very wrong idea of of love and maybe his distinction of the two categories of love is kind of corrupted his thought on this yeah. a bit. Uh, what do we think of the spark notes? I think they kind of tricked me into thinking that this was going to be a different speech than it was. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think they're wrong. Or, there's many ways, you know, it, as you said, that it sounds uh, smart or like what he's talking about is legit. And then uh, it's really not at all. Once once you focus on the examples he's giving, it's it's uh, very backwards. The Spark Notes has deceived you, young man. <laughs> and I think Plato has deceived whoever wrote those Spark Notes. So Definitely. the teacher I work with, Dr. Pierre Grimes, he used to say when I first started working with him in the early years, he would often say that all he really does is teach people how to read. And this is a really good example of the importance of critical reading and seeing just what is on the page. So this is one that he liked to work with um, to see what it really says, because it is, if you check other places, other spark notes was one example, but if you check anywhere on the internet, what do other um, commentators say about this speech? That is the general feeling that it's about virtue and he believes in virtue. And if you go back to the spark notes, you see he's kind of doing acrobatics, trying to explain how this is somehow virtuous. Um, that's what people want to take from it because it has that language and it has that feel. And again, if you don't read it critically and you don't see just what it says, it's like so shocking that you think it can't be saying that he must be saying something virtuous. And this is Plato. But that's what it says. Yeah, this guy should be in jail. And um, this line, I don't quite understand it. The footnote says it has something to do with um, a play on words in the um, Greek. But his praise made a pause with this phrase. So I just have this image of like all the people at this drinking party just being speechless. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine being at this party and you're all drinking and everyone is drinking as much as they want and they just had some food and they're kicking back and they're having these talks and this guy comes up and there's been a few talks because he said he couldn't remember the guy who um, was telling the story. Aristodemus, by the way, doesn't tell his own story either. I don't know why that was left out, but that's a curious question. But a bunch of stories were told, and then it came around to Pausanias. They all must be very drunk by this time. And this is just on the spur of the moment, it says. So just off the top of his head, and he's rattling off these ideas about complaining that uh, fathers will call, will have their tutors keep their 12-year-olds away from him. It's so unfair. And could you imagine being at this drinking party? They must have just been speechless. So the Spark Notes claim that everybody is speechless. Uh, no, I didn't see any comment about this. This is just my, oh. my uh, comment, that his praise made a pause with this phrase. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what it means, actually. It may have a different meaning. Um, <laughs> Because it has something to do, the footnote says um, that it's a pun that has to do with the, um, the Greek words. Um, so it probably has a different meaning. But like my image is just, I, I just imagine, I'm just adding something to it. So this is not in the text, but I'm just adding that when I try to picture this drinking party, they must have all been speechless. Um, by the way, historically... 
Athenius is supposedly was um, a lover of Agathon, who is the the tragic writer who had won the prize they're all celebrating from the day before. I wonder how that young man felt after hearing the speech. <laughs> There's no comment about it, so it's not something relevant to um, Plato's version of events. But that's just a side note. I'm sorry, Jed, you're about to say something. I'm not hearing you, Jed. Oh, oh no, no, no. I was, I was just wondering if um, maybe his last line, uh, this is just something off the spare of the moment. I wonder if that is itself a lie, because it sounds like something he's had a gripe about for a while. Um, so it may have been something he's thought about. Mm -hmm. And so he, in that last line, that could be an example of the very person he's been describing as somebody who is kind of okay of, to lie. It's okay to lie so long as it's in seeking this. Mm -hmm. So his, so maybe he's sort of demonstrating the very thing he's been def defining by lying that it's off the top of his head when it's not. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Um, we have to be careful not to add anything and, but we can kind of imagine that kind of person that is something he may not have planned what he's going to say, but yeah, these are thoughts he's probably had for a while. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop there for now. There is a little bit of a transition to the next speech. We can cover that next time. The next speech is not quite as long as this one. Eh, it's kind of long. Um, but that transition kind of goes well with the next speech. Okay, so I'm going to save that one for next time. Any final words, though, before we sign off? So the uh, the very next line was the thing about the pause. Just that made a pause. It was like that kind of clicked in my mind. Is all they were all speechless, but I'm not sure if that's what it. Means. Yeah, maybe looking at each other, saying, uh, "Who invited this guy?" Yeah, like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> what do we say now? <laughs> How do you respond after a speech like this one? And this is the the speech of uh, Pausanias. Mm -hmm who was the person who suggested the drinking in the first place. Oh, that's Eryximachus, Eryximachus who is the next speaker. He, um, right, right. Well, he, he suggested it as a form of medicine. But I think the first person mentioned was, was this fellow who suggested drinking again, even though they're hung over. And then, um, uh, uh, Eryximachus suggested it as a form of medicine. And then Phaedrus um, said, "I listened. I listened to Rexy Marcus in, in uh, forms of medicine, mm. uh, which is interesting because Rexy Marcus also listens back to uh, Phaedrus on the suggestion of this whole game of making a speech uh, to love. Mm. So those two seem to be uh, listening to each other." Mm. Mm. But it's interesting that um, this is the sort of person who suggested or, or first floated the idea to begin with, uh, this, this idea of who's, who's giving the instruction, who's, who's ruling has been in my mind uh, since the beginning, like who's be and especially since um, uh, uh, the party is um, Agathon's party, and he was the guy who suggested Socrates sit at the end of the table in the lowest position. And he was also the guy who wanted Socrates to be interrupted when he was in yeah, his... Not part of this conversation. Yeah. Sorry, yes, Agathon, I'm sorry. Yeah, so Agathon, Agathon's uh, party, the House of the Good, he, he was the guy who... Yeah. Pausanias has suggested not drinking heavily, only as much as you want. Mm-hmm. I, I just find it interesting who, like, who's following whose suggestion, mm -hmm. and and I don't think we mentioned it last time, but um, I was quite puzzled mm -hmm. by the fact that Agathon, whose house they're at, who's been given the award, um, who supposedly is the good man who Socrates became be dressed beautifully for, 
he wanted to interrupt Socrates when he was contemplating. He was the one saying, go, go interrupt him. I know he's standing on the balcony in some sort of uh, contemplative state, but bring him in. And it was um, uh, Aristodemus who was saying no, 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 over and over again. Right. And that, that stuck out to me because when he did arrive, um, Agathon said, oh, um, you must have reached your, uh, what you are after, your wisdom. So he did convey that he had some sort of understanding that what Socrates was doing was something wise, and yet he thought it good to interrupt him. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if wisdom has anything to do with beauty, mm-hmm. and uh, he is saying, you must have grasped it because you've come to our house, mm-hmm. um, then he the person who's been given the award, the person who's in charge has already shown that um, he doesn't really respect the highest form of love and desire for the beautiful. If he's knowingly willing to interrupt Socrates in that state. Right. Exactly. Uh, that's just a hypothesis at this stage, but that's what I was, have been thinking since last week. Another hint at that because Socrates didn't even bother going there the day before to hear him speak. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's kind of a, a Socrates' response to the wisdom idea was kind of cheeky and insulting. It was cheeky and insulting. And when this game was suggested, nobody asked Socrates what they should do. I found it really cool that Socrates stepped in and he kind of made a slight amendment to the game. It's like, all right, I've been seated, I've been seated at the end of the table for some reason, um, and we'll go along with this game and we'll make it such that if the person making the speech first at the top of the table um, does such a good job, then that will be the conclusion of the game. They'll win. Mm. Um, so even though they've placed him last, he was able to give a slight contribution that kind of made it better Mm. Mm. because the implication of that is he'll be last to act. Mm. So if he's acting, the implication will be, yes, you've fallen short. Yeah. They've needed him Mm -hmm. and these creepy weirdos have missed the mark. (laughs) Yes. And also, Pausanias changed the rules, and so we'll see in the next speech if those rules remain or if they go back to the original rules or what does Eryximachus do from there. So that's where we'll pick it up next time. And uh, Jacob, any final words? None here. Okay. Then uh, those of you watching on YouTube... Uh, Please hit the like button. You watched it this far. And also please subscribe if you don't already. And if you have any questions or comments, as always, please leave those below. And I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you very much.